Stevens here over at Mortgage Shots. Coming to you on this Monday. Lots of lots of information to cover today. Nothing is more apropos than this statement, is it? Uh, what a long, strange trip it's been. I kind of think back on this whole thing, and you know, we go back to COVID and even pre-COVID. It seems like it's been more chaotic in the past uh, year and a half, two years, than it's been over the past, oh my God, at least 10 years, 15 years, probably dating back to like the 2008 meltdown that we had back then. But the last couple of years in particular, um, they've been uh, extremely nutty. You know what it kind of reminds me of? I remember back in 2008, I thought, oh boy, you know what? Uh, 2009 is going to be a much better year. And uh, of course, 2009 hit and then 2009 kind of continued to degrade. And then 2010 hit, things continued to degrade. And before you know it, uh, things started to kind of fix themselves, but it certainly took a while to, to go ahead and do that. And I think that's kind of exactly where we're at. But you cannot forget the simple fact that things always do change. The one good thing about having an industry like the real estate and mortgage lending industry that's great is it's in flux constantly, means it will ebb and it will flow, but it will always ebb and flow up and down. So I got a lot of information to cover today and make sure if you like what you're watching right now that you share it, make sure that you subscribe and, uh, and leave some comments down below and let me know what you think no matter what platform you're watching this on. Here's one of the things that I wanted to put out there before we uh, get going here, because this is huge. And I put up here, this is for realtors, but really it's for anybody who has the aptitude and the desire. It's the uh, ultimate investor partner. They're ready for you right now. What does that mean? Well, imagine having a concierge partner who's going to help you build your, your investor business. Cultivate your business. You might not have investors, but boy, do we have a plan of attack for you to get them. And there's a ton of them, and that's a huge part of where the market is today. Click on that QR code, and what it will do is it'll send out a form, and we'll reach directly out to you. And now, the reason why this slide looks so shitty is because uh, I just, I'm so excited about this darn product that I just wanted to get it out. It's a new revenue stream for anybody, really, with the aptitude to do this. It's definitely a way for you to grow your business, uh, new income streams. It's a huge marketing opportunity, and I got to tell you, all of of this falls outside of the purview of qualified mortgages. Now, qualified mortgages are where the real pain in the ass kind of lie, don't they? And from that's from a lender's perspective. Qualified, not a pain in the ass, but like the rules of engagement are different once you get to investors. Here's the thing for real estate agents. Just like lenders know, the rules of engagement are different for investors. So I know that we're facing a bunch of class action lawsuits and there's uncertainty in the air for real estate agents and lenders, but for realtors out there where you're looking where you could take your skills set and really find a great opportunity. This is unlike anything you have ever seen before, and it has absolutely nothing to do inside of the lawsuits that you're facing because investors are a different game. Make sure you kick the, uh, click that QR code and let me and my team get you started. Okay, so let's move on to what we're talking about, and, and that'll make more sense as we're going into this here. But single family homes sales to investors hit an all time high. Now, I find this kind of peculiar because I've heard uh, news about investors backing out of the market a little bit. Where we're kind of seeing it where is with, um, you know, the, the fix and flippers. Now, the fix and flippers aren't really looking at properties right now as much as they have in the past. The numbers have gone down over the past consecutive couple of months. And the reason is, is that they're just not profitable enough. Now, I want you to get a load of this. This is a trip. Did you know that profits on a fix and flip on average are down across this country? Did you know that? Leave your comments and let me know in the comments what you're thinking about this. Did you know that though? Now, get a load of this. How much do you think the average investor makes on a fix and flip? The average across the country. So I'm talking about like North Carolina, Mississippi, or excuse me, um, North Dakota, Mississippi, you know, the Kansas of the world, along with California, New York. So we average it all out. When you do a fix and flip, flip I'm going to buy it. I'm going to put lipstick on a pig and I'm going to sell that sucker. What do you think the average investor is getting? This is nuts. The average investor right now is getting $66,000 and that number is down from $72,000 just a couple short months ago. $66,000 freaking Dollars, And we wonder why we have so many investors in this country. You know what? Investors are pulling back right now. We don't have enough pot profits on these fix and flips. It's down to $66,000. From a lender or a real estate agent standpoint, if you are astute, you will know this singular fact that you have an area that has not fallen under the jurisdiction of a lot of these regulatory changes that are in front of us that are extremely punitive for both you and your broker, and you should be heading in this direction. It is a growing part of the industry. It's absolutely massive. 
and you don't have to deal with all the bullshit that we're dealing with between lenders, their lawsuits, and real estate agents, their lawsuits. Lenders, by the way, you're all facing lawsuits and you're going to face these in a similar fashion to what real estate agents have just experienced over the past year. It's coming to a theater near you. So from a loan officer, get in front of the problem and start getting to some of these investors. But I want you to look at this. In October, November, December, the share of single family homes purchased by investors was 28%, 27%, and 28.7% respectively, according to a report at least released by CoreLogic. It beat out the previous all-time high of 28.3% in February 2022. So when we're saying that investors are picking up a bigger share of the market right now, they're they're doing it in droves. Now, one of the problems is, is the Black Rocks of the world. And if you did not see my Black Rock show, all you have to do is go to MortgageShots.com. I talk about how insidious Black Rock is to the entire country, and frankly, the entire world. Did you know the investment group Black Rock? Did you know that they are the top investor in 505 out of the 5 505 S&P 500s companies. They're the top investor in all of them. They own everybody. They right now just uh, tipped a market cap rate of over $10 trillion. And if you look at the GDP and the wealth of BlackRock, they would be the third largest country, not company, but country in the world, only behind the United States and China. That's right. BlackRock has a bigger economy than Germany, than France, than England, than India, than Japan. And BlackRock is out there. Frankly, I think they're behind a lot of the crap that we're seeing right now. The BlackRock is out there wildly, heavily investing in real estate, not only with a single family residence, but also for multifamily residents in the large uh, condo complexes that we see getting put up and the rezoning that's taking place all across this country, they have a lot to do with. So we would suspect that these numbers would be changing. However, it doesn't change the fact that when you see superlatives like the largest amount of investors purchasing properties in the history of the country ever, from a lender standpoint or a real est- realtor standpoint, this should really kind of tell you the direction that you need to go. The share of purchases made by investors could exceed 30% by 2024. Now, think about that. The highest uh, percentage of investors we ever had since we've been keeping records is in 2022. Does that strike you as kind of odd? It's a real shitty time if you think if you're like, um, you know, if you're some 26, 27 year old kid and you got a family, you're having a kid right now and the idea is you want to buy a house. You know where you're going to buy, have to buy your house? You're going to have to buy your house on, um, you know, on uh, at, at Walmart or you're going to have to go to Amazon and get an Amazon house that comes in boxes. Uh, the purchases recorded by investors in the fourth quarter between 79 and 80,000 purchases were per month are still similar to figures recorded by investors pre-pandemic before an investing surge in 2021 that stands in contrast to purchases made by owner occupants who are purchasing about 100,000 fewer homes. You know, another reason for this, guys, is when you look at interest rates right now, so when you're sitting in the sevens and you're sitting in the eights, it, so we we actually bid all the properties up in the entire country based on interest rates in the twos and the threes. Of course, you have more spending power with the lower interest rates, so we bid them up super high. Then we raised rates and we said, okay, we're not going to deviate from where home values are right now. So that same house, because your purchasing power has diminished, is going to be very difficult for your entry level and even a lot of move up buyers to go ahead and afford. I mean, I look at some of these prices on these properties. Can you imagine like out here in California, on average, a home value is $780,000. Can you imagine doing an FHA loan on a $780,000 house with both MIs and a rate of seven or a six and a half, whatever you're going to get? It'd be insane. So I think what else is happening right now is investors are coming in because they don't have to deal with rates. They can go out there and they can become cash purchasers. And when you're a cash purchaser, well, interest rates don't matter. So now that we're seeing a drop in property values, well, of course, investors are going to come in and start picking these up. But what it continues to do is erode the very fabric of this country. So when we see what's taking place in our in uh, the housing market with our limited inventory, with higher interest rates going up, now dropping them because of the handout post-COVID, and uh, then the feds, you know, um, raising their balance sheet by buying every mortgage-backed security in the country, and then just going doing an about face and raising rates faster than anybody has done since 1980, we've created the perfect toxic environment for investors to come in and take a larger share of where the market is right now. We actually did this. This is kind of by design. Do you understand that? So anyways, and listen, we are in a kind of um, survival of the fittest mode. Who's the one who could actually, who's got the acumen to read the tea leaves of the direction of the market, where it's going? Well, I hope it's you. It certainly is what we're trying to do over here. And this should let real estate agents and lenders know how to adjust their sales to get through these markets. If we have to go bigger on investors, go bigger on investors. But let's not just do it. Let's not just say I'm going to be an, I'm going to be an investor's agent. I'm going to be a, a mortgage loan officer who specializes in this. I would ask you, 
you, what does it take to specialize as an investor agent or an investor loan officer? Now, we over here at Mortgage Shots, we have our, we know what we're doing. We absolutely know. If you want to understand how to infiltrate that market, you're going to have to reach out to us. Uh, I'm not spilling all the beans here. I'll tell you what, the, I'll diagnose the problem. But if you're looking for a pill for the cure, that's that's the one where you're going to have to participate in this game more than just watching a free uh, a live air. Now, Here's what Minnesota is doing about the investor epidemic, and I do call it an epidemic. It's becoming something of a problem in this country. Uh, it's being perpetuated by our states and on the on a federal level for, through rezoning laws that are changing areas that were deemed fit for single family residents to be replaced by these these mega apartment complexes, which are owned by BlackRock. So anyways, it's interesting that Minneapolis is doing this because Minneapolis has been one of the more aggressive rezoning uh, cities in the country. That and St. Paul, frankly, you know, Minneapolis and, and um, St. Paul have been really aggressive in this area, meaning what they've done is they've tried to bring their cost of living down and they've, pr they've been more effective in that singular objective, more so than any state in the country. But that also comes at a, uh, at a cost as well, creating a toxic environment. What they've done is they've they've gone condo crazy. They've gone apartment crazy, where if you want to go ahead and rent, you, you go over to Minneapolis, go over to St. Paul. You can find rental units. Prices have come down. I remember this by over $800 per, excuse me, $800 lower than what your average monthly mortgage payment is going to be. So they've been very effective. But again, when you replace single family residents, you don't set roots in that community. And when you don't set roots in a community, your community doesn't function as well as it could. Uh, there's a million different studies. And I read one, strangely enough, from a San Diego State University. But there was a great study that I got or a white paper that I got. And I went through and I read this whole thing. And really what it amounted to, I'll give you the cliff notes on cliff notes on it. It, you, it is directly proportional, the uh, performance of your schools the and the amount of crime in your communities. And even the matter uh, the the amount of pollution in your community, it is directly proportional to the number of people who own homes versus rental rent homes. I'm not saying people who rent homes are shitty. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just pragmatically looking at this and saying when people own homes, it works better. More than two dozen DFL lawmakers are hoping to advance a bill that would require corporate landlords to divest uh, some of their single family homes or else face fines. Now, can you imagine that? So this could be viewed as an overreach. And the overreach is, is now that they're coming in, uh, Minnesota's coming in and saying, hold on a second, if you own 15 properties, we're going to fine you $100,000 for each one of those properties over 10 that you own. A version uh, presented to the House Judiciary Finance and Civil Laws Committee on Tuesday would prevent corporate owners from owning more than 10 single family homes in Minnesota that they use as rental properties. The penalty for landlords violating the cap would either be to divest those properties or receive a $100,000 fine per excess unit. But anyways, once again, guys, if you want to have more information about what's going on with investors and how you can get in front of this, go ahead and hit this QR code. You know, the thing is, is this is what we're going to do. We are going to do what is we're going to try to give a booster shot to this industry. We are going to go out there and actively pursue investors. We're going to do this with our partners over at Truly, where we have our own concierge um, sidekick helping us out with what our endeavors are. And the reason why we're able to do this is because Truly is going to be doing like they're remarkable, just a huge amount of the heavy lifting. Again, we've already done an interviews with these guys we'll probably link it down in the comments down below but the thing is here is like if you want to find a strategy on how to approach these investors so we can go ahead one they're a huge part of our of what we're doing but two i mean we need to find a way through the difficulties we're facing right now this is a pretty interesting uh, little graph that i found i got this on my reddit feed it just came out today where the prices are still rising so this is just talking about inflation it's the united states consumer price index also known as the cdp 12 month percentage change from march 23 to 2024. All right, so here's what we got. Things that have actually gone down in price. And notice everything that's gone down in price is... Frankly, I, I just not of significant in, interest to me. For instance, used car, uh, a new car, uh, new vehicles has largely unchanged. Used cars and trucks, largely unchanged. I, I guess that's kind of important. But college textbooks, I don't give two shits about college textbooks. And by the way, if you're buying brand new college textbooks, you're an idiot anyways, because they've got they've got that off campus place that will sell used books to you for you know a few bucks a piece. And the, yeah, exactly. And how many of them are going digital? Well, anyways, they're going digital, so they probably that's part the reason why they're going down televisions are going down does anyone actually even use a television my monitor is my television airline fares i mean those go up and down toys don't care it's not a huge part of anybody's life like when i look at things that i can get rid of i can get rid of my toys uh car trucks and uh, rentals again how often are you renting a truck and if you're renting a car your company's generally doing it and the price of smartphones have gone down again things that aren't, aren't of like a huge interest to me now prices that are going up 
Food. Yeah, food at home, that's a big one for me. That's going up. Gasoline, big one for me. Our gas out here in California is six bucks a gallon again, and nobody's even talking about it. They're not talking about it because it's just, it's common fare now. Like if it, this was five years ago and we hit $6 gas, it would be the top news story everywhere in the state of California. But right now, $6 gas, it's not even a footnote on the a footnote on the back page of the newspaper, uh, metaphorically speaking, of course. Energy, I care about that one because I use it constantly. Food and beverages, care about that one, use it constantly. Ed- Education, I do care about that one. That should be free. All items, 3.5% over here. And did you know, by the way, this is another interesting point. Did you know that we have just changed our calculation on how we calculate inflation? Did you know this? So our inflation numbers are actually showing differently than they were showing like six months ago. Because if you don't like what you're getting with the results, all you have to do is not fix the problem. Just change how you come to your conclusion. Now, when I was a kid, that was called lying. But this is what we just did. When you look at what the Fed is reading... To make their decisions based on what the Census Bureau is go over there giving them to them when it comes to figuring out inflation. They're actually looking at different numbers based on different algorithms than they were a few months ago. I'm applying the same logic to a different algorithm. That frankly scares me a little bit. Anyways, going up, transportation, that one scares me. Food away from home. Housing, of course, that's a huge one. Electricity, that's a huge one. Rent, that's a huge one. Hospital services, that's a that could be a big one. Well, it is a big one. Uh, motor vehicle repair, that's a big one. And the biggest increase in in cost, Joanna, from March 2023 to 2024, then expenditure that you're going to have to pay and I'm paying. What do you think it is? Housing is not housing ranks number five. Then you'll know you're going to be like, of course, it's insurance. Insurance. The, the, the conversation nobody's having right now across this country. Insurance is not a, hey, listen, if you can get insurance for twice the price you got it three years ago, you ought to be happy. Thank you, lucky stars, because most people, especially out here where we live and in other high risk states of natural disasters, they can no longer get any insurance. I mean, it's not even available. So anyways, I thought this was a pretty interesting graph. If you're a lender or a realtor, this would be something great to share with your partners out there and have a conversation about it and use that as a means of getting closer and drumming up some business. This is kind of interesting here. The spread on the 30-year fixed rate mortgage and 10-year treasury, uh, treasury securities, we see that they're going down. Here's one of the things. I, I just let's just face it. When you have unrest in the world, it's good for mortgage interest rates. If we want interest rates to go down, all we got to do is lob missiles at another country and everything's going to get a little bit better over here. Isn't that tragic? But it's kind of where we're at. So I think when I mean, I think what we're going to see with the unrest in the Middle East is I think we're going to see I, I don't think we're going to see a spike in rates, but I think this is an opportunity to see rates coming down a little bit. In the near um, in the near future, and it doesn't look like anything is going to change over there very quickly. When it comes to our inventory, check this out: our weekly inventory changed April fifth to the twelfth. Uh, our inventory rose uh, from five hundred twelve nine to five twenty six four sixty two. That's a good number for us. The same time last year, inventory fell. Look at the difference between where we are now and where we were last year. So we went from uh, four eleven to five twelve. We have a hundred thousand on April fifth and April seventh. We had a we have a hundred thousand more properties on the market. This this April uh, than we did uh, just a year prior. And now overall we're sitting at 526,000 where we were sitting at 406,600, meaning we've got 120,000 more properties on the market now at this point than we did last year. And that's good news. What we would like to see is we'd like to see a a one in front of it. The all-time inventory bottom was 2022 and that's when we hit 240,000. Remember those days? That was certainly fun. And the inventory peak is 569,898. So we're not terribly far from where the peak is right now. And you know, when we're looking at a peak back in 2023 of 5698, you know, the thing is this. Back in uh, the, the peak in 2023, property values were still wildly um, overpriced for what the consumer was able to pay, you know. I can't have a $14 banana and I can't have because you can't afford it. It simply is untenable. We can't have properties, this property values this high. So, or excuse me, we can't have property values this high. So when we're looking at our inventory numbers over there, that 569, as I said, just a couple of moments ago, needs to be significantly higher. We're like, we honestly need to double that number. If we want to start seeing a market that's going to be uh, affordable for people to actually start buying houses again and kick some of those investors out here again, here's a, here's a, a number of our single family home inventory. When we go back, look at, that when we go back to 2019, we were at nearly a million. We have half of what we had just back in 2019. So this really kind of shows you the dire straits that we find ourselves in here. Um, Here's national new single family listings. That gives you the numbers up, up top. 
Again, remarkably anemic, wildly below where we need to be. But we're at 67,000, where just a couple years ago we we're at 66,000. Uh, what we need to see is builders, frankly, building more properties. But, you know, as I said, the problem that we're facing is that a lot of builders out there right now, they've reimagined what their uh, description is for their, for their company. And a lot of these companies, they're doing a couple of things. Uh, they're going, they're building out these, let's call them projects, um, these housing projects. But what they're doing is they're going directly to investors. They're keeping the realtors out of the game. They're keeping the home buyers out of the game. So they're building these projects and they're going over to the Black Rocks of the world and saying, you know, we don't want to deal with the hassle of selling this to Jane and Joe, a uh, first time home buyer. Why don't we just sell it to the behemoth Black Rock and why don't you buy all the properties? And that's going to save us a lot of time, energy and resources. And as a, as a result, save money. And so they're selling single family homes directly to these massive uh, corporate investors, which is at just destroying the fabric of our country. Uh, but the other thing is, is they're also the ones building these large complexes. Uh, that are being rezoned for uh, apartments rather than single family homes. National single family listings. Here's our price drops where we are. We saw our big drop. And then just a, about a month ago, a month and a half ago, we started seeing property values go up. And I think what we're seeing nationally is we're starting our ebb and flow where property values are going down once again. Uh, these numbers, you know, here's the deal. When we're looking at property values going up or down, and that's the thing, we're, we're talking about fractions of a percent. You know, property values went down. Now that price, that house that's over overpriced by $200,000 is $10,000 cheaper. It's still $190,000 overpriced, and that's the major problem, isn't it? So um, what we're really seeing is we're seeing property values increasing. Until we change the amount of inventory that we have on the market, until that changes, it, it makes no difference what takes place with interest rates. It doesn't whatsoever. And, it, ta- and, it, and it, it makes no difference how many people want these homes. Property values are going to continue to increase on this one point until our inventory increases. We need more listings to drive prices down. The, you know, the thing is, is when it comes to affordability, everybody wants affordability on housing, but nobody wants to get rid of their equity. How do you feel? Well, yes, I want houses. I want I want affordable houses, Joanna, so people can live in them. Yeah, that sounds great. I want neighbors who own their houses. All right, are you willing for your house to take a $150,000 hit in order to make that happen? And the answer is no. Well, not on my dime. Well, that's what's going to have to happen. So there is, there are forces at play that frankly don't want the inventory that would correct our market because people are holding selfishly onto what they believe to be their equity. If you believe that's the case, then I would advise you to sell your house today, bank that money right now, and buy, the house, buy, buy a house when a property values do drop once again. Uh, mark, market predictions for 2024. When are homes going to be uh, affordable again? I don't. Here's here's the honest to God answer. I see the chief economist of Fannie Mae. He's he's certainly got an idea of when properties are going to be affordable again. But fan, this is the same Fannie Mae that just came out a couple of weeks, a weeks ago and gave us predictions on interest rates, a forecast that was going through 2025 only to be revised a couple of days later, uh, which screams at me they don't know what they're talking about. So I'm not terribly concerned about what the chief economist at Fannie Mae has to say about this. The reason I put this up there is for loan officers and real estate agents to understand this point. Housing market predictions for 2024. When will home prices be affordable again? And I'm going to say it's not my concern. I can't affect change on affordability in houses again. Therefore, I'm going to deal with the reality that's right in front of my eyes. I'm going to go ahead and put together a marketing plan that's going to work for me today. And whatever happens with housing, the prices, with rates, their pricing, the lawsuits, and all the other crazy distractions that we have going on, I'm going to put that behind me. I mean, there's have you heard the saying, there's a, there's a reason why your rear view mirror is smaller than your windshield. You know what? Because that means you need to be looking at what you can do so you can keep your business business going forward. With that said, the housing market is likely to continue to face a, a dual affordability constraints of high home prices and elevated interest rates. Okay, precisely what we talked about. If rates come down there, you know, interest rates, somebody said one time, interest rates go up like rockets and they come down with parachutes. And so we're not going to see interest rates drop significantly overnight. It's going to be something that's going to take a period of time. And of course, housing prices, there's nothing that's going to change that uh, as fast as we would like to see that change. We're not talking months, guys. We're talking years here. Hotter than expected inflation data and strong payroll numbers are likely to apply more upward pressure to mortgage rates this year than we've previously forecast. You know, the thing is, there's a real disattachment here, isn't there, with rates and what the Fed is doing 
and the difficulty at the street level for people to afford the goods and services that are around them. And they're saying things are too good right now. We're going to have to keep rates high for an extended period of time. I, I, I thought about this. When you look, when you consider inflation, this is not inflation. This is just our new reality. Because when you go down to Chili's to get your baby back ribs and they're now $3 more expensive and it's right there on the menu, guess what? They're not going to relaminate any new menus anytime soon to bring prices down for you. The prices that are there underneath those laminated men paper menus are going to be there in perpetuity. And that's the case with all the other goods and services. We don't really roll back prices too much, do we? Especially with a lot of the policies, particularly like my state of California, which is, is making every policy change humanly possible to ensure that inflation is going to be a, a, a difficult thing for everyone to deal with for a, a super long time. Uh, as far as it comes to housing, and I thought this was interesting, like how is inflation, how is the cost of, of homes right now, which is unaffordable, you're now as a, a home buyer, you're up against more investors now than ever. How does a first time home buyer, or as Joanna says, how do the vets, how do they navigate the waters of these markets? You see, because at the same time, we made it more difficult for these first time home buyers and these vets to go out there and navigate the waters of these markets as a home buyer, maybe even a home seller, but certainly as a home buyer, what we've done is we've almost completely taken away the ability for them to work with a professional agent to go out there and help them. You know, I know that there's agents out there who will actually, when they do their list, when they have their listings and they're looking at offers, I've heard agents talking about this and and their and their their sellers are going, well, which offer would you take? And the agent, being honest, would say, you know what? I'm much more interested in selling this house to somebody who's going to live in the house than the investor because my friends live in this community. I don't want an investor to own this house in my community where I raise my kids. I'm still going to be visiting this community. I'm only going to be four blocks, six blocks, eight blocks away from uh, the house that I'm vacating right now. I want to keep as many owner occupant properties that I can. And if I can, if 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 I have to take two thousand dollars less to put a family in there versus putting the Black Rock, uh, putting Black Rock in there, I would personally put the family in there. I've heard real st real estate agents doing this, much to the benefit of our communities. Now, when it comes to putting offers in, if that's not necessarily the case, and I'm a first time home buyer and I'm buying a house and I'm up against an investor or two investors, I like the idea that my real estate agent's talking to that real estate agent so we can kind of work through some of these issues because my real estate agent is going to go to him and say, hey, listen, if you're up against investors, let's have this conversation. It is it is way better for everybody involved if we take this owner-occupied offer rather than the uh, investment property offer. How are buyers and sellers going to navigate these waters that have gotten infinitely more difficult even in the past 12 months and are going to get way more difficult when we start to see some of these changes implemented? That's going to lim limit the ability for professional representation. Limit the ability for professional representation is going to be limited and it's going to come at a cost to our communities and it's going to come at a cost uh, to people trying to buy houses. And as, again, most uh, specifically underserved communities and those with a low to moderate income level levels who simply can't afford to go ahead and pay for representation. The, the reality is, you know, everybody, like, I think all of our politicians and all the lawyers are looking at this saying, oh, we just did away with these commissions for these real estate agents. Bravo, bravo. We made things cheaper for everybody. But in the process of doing so, you took the professionality out of the real estate game. So that's what I think is going to hurt us. So what do I, what's the housing market predictions for 2024? When are houses going to be affordable again? Uh, they're not going to be affordable any anytime soon. And the truth is, when it comes to demand, and the demand is going to go significantly down because there's going to be buyers who aren't even going to look at the real estate market because they don't have that neighbor who's a real estate agent saying, you can actually buy a house right now. Go talk to my lender. Those conversations are going to start to disappear. And when that takes place, everybody is going to lose. Uh, why is this a problem? Here's my final slide, guys. Here is the typical U.S. home value state by state. Out in California, we're sitting close to a million dollars for your average home price. When we get a couple of states over, I don't know, is, is that, let's see, that's Oklahoma, is that Kansas, Nebraska, one of those one of those suckers in there? I mean, you're still looking at 600,000, five, 600,000. All of these numbers are insane. So listen, do me a favor and reach out to us. Share this if you like what we're sharing with you today. Uh, tune in tomorrow. We're going to bring more great information to you and I hope y'all, hope y'all have a great day. Talk to you soon. <music>